Okay, hey, this is Stefan Kinsella, my podcast Kinsella on Liberty, episode 260, I think it'll be. That's stefankinsella.com slash KOL260. Um, and I am, I usually don't, I usually just put on my podcast feed when I get interviewed by someone else or give a speech. It's, it's, that's my point. Every now and then I'll talk to someone. And I'm talking right now to Nick Sarwark, the chairman of the Libertarian Party. Say hello, Nick. Hello, Stefan. And you're driving in your car somewhere right now, right? I am. I'm in uh, beautiful Phoenix, Arizona, which is colder than normal. Uh, we've gotten some unseasonable weather, but we try not to complain too much because soon enough it'll be like living on the surface of the sun. <laughs> and are, aren't you are you running for mayor there or something like that, or do you do you do that a lot? I, or I was. Okay. I, I ran for mayor in the 2018 election, and the way our municipal races work, uh, it's a kind of a jungle primary in the first round, and then the top two go into a runoff, and I did not make the runoff. So I'm done running for mayor for now. Gotcha. Um, well, you and I were talking yesterday. We, we met a few months ago in Houston uh, in person, and I joined the Libertarian Party a few months ago. Um, and so uh, we were just kind of chatting on one of my uh, uh, provocative posts on Facebook about something. So we decided we'd, let's just have a chat about this because you're a lawyer too. I, I actually hadn't realized that, but when I heard you speaking in Houston, you kept saying some things that were uh, extraordinarily sophisticated for a layman. And I thought, oh, this guy must be a lawyer, and yet you, you are. So, uh, so you're a lawyer too, right? I am. I got my uh, letter of mark from the Supreme Court of Colorado in 2008. <laughs> okay. Have, 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 are you like me? You've gotten libertarians who give you uh, – they give you guff about having sworn an oath to the state bar and you're selling out and all that. Have you, have you ever had that attack? I have a, had a little bit of that, um, and I was a deputy public defender for the state of Colorado for five years, so I've also gotten the – how can you work for the government uh, line of attack? Right, even though you're defending people from being attacked by the government. Yeah, the way I, I look at it is I'm perfectly happy to dismantle the public defender's office as soon as we dismantle the DA's office. You know, But I'm, I'm not one for unilateral disarmament when it comes to criminal justice issues. Okay, so you're the chairman of the LP, is that correct? I am. Now is that uh, that's not a full time job because you obviously have another job too, I think, right? Yeah, it's a it's a volunteer position. Uh, oh, it is. Okay, it's not, been, so it's not paying at all. For, I didn't realize that. Okay. It is not. It uh, you know, there's some reimbursement for expenses that are associated with party business, but no, we it's a labor of love. Well, how often? Let me ask you this because I saw you in Houston, and that's not a big. This is not Houston. It's not the most important sort of. City, so you must travel a good deal um, for Libertarian Party business. Yeah, it um, over the last it's been gosh five years now uh, being chair. I average probably about twelve to fourteen trips a year to various things, state conventions, um, you know, going to state legislators and lobbying for bills or. Uh, being deposed by the federal government, that was delightful. Oh, uh, what was that about? Uh, we are suing the Federal Election Commission uh, over some of their campaign finance restrictions. So the FEC says that if you die and leave money to the Libertarian National Committee in your will, which everyone should, that the National Committee cannot take from that estate more than the statutory annual maximum per year, uh, which is uh, just an absurd regulation, even if you buy into campaign finance law and the need to avoid a corruption or the appearance of corruption, the idea that a dead person could somehow get a quid pro quo, uh, you know, absent something we don't know about the afterlife, doesn't seem like it makes sense. So they wanted to depose me uh, as part of our challenge to their law, and we, I think, 
that oral argument was um, in front of the D.C. Circuit maybe December. I want to say end of November, beginning of December. So hopefully we'll get a, an opinion on it soon, and hopefully they'll strike that down. Gotcha. Okay, and how long have you been uh, LP chair? Uh, I was first elected at the National Convention in 2014 in Columbus, Ohio, and then re-elected at the 2016 convention in Orlando, and then re-re-elected at the 2018 convention in New Orleans. So I'm okay. now the first three-term consecutive chair in Libertarian Party history. Really? Very nice. Uh, and, and how long, just curious, uh, how long have you been into libertarianism yourself uh, as, a, as, a, as a young man? So I got involved. Um, I, my dad took me to Maricopa County meetings here in Phoenix when I was, you know, probably 10, 11, 12 years old. And I read Berglund's Libertarianism in one lesson, and it made sense to me even as a 12 year old. So I've always identified as a libertarian. I'm actually coming up um, this weekend on my 20th year as a party member. Got it. February 24th, 1999. We need to come up with a prefix for libertarians. If if you identify as a libertarian, so we need a prefix like Z or instead of he or Ms. or, or Mr. Maybe, 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 <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe Lizzer. <laughs> I that think would sound a little we'll bit too much like David Icke. Yeah, yeah, I, I've been accused of being a reptilian, so let's not go that that direction. But you well, know, we'll we'll work into you. it. I think. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, just for people listening that are curious, uh, uh, will you deny right now that you're a reptilian? I will deny that I'm a reptilian. I am. But, I'm yeah, but of course, of course that's what that's humanity. what you would say. That's what you would say, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, did you pra- uh, do you practice law, or did you practice law actually as a career, or what's your legal uh, sort of background? Yeah, so I practiced for five years as a deputy public defender in Colorado. Uh, okay. I think I got up to about thirty-six trials to a jury, everything from you know relatively low-level misdemeanors up to a couple of first-degree murder cases. Uh, one argument in front of the Colorado Supreme Court in which, uh, unfortunately, the justices got it wrong, as okay. they are sometimes wont to do. Okay. Um, so I did that from 2009 up through 2014, and then I uh, moved back to Phoenix mm-hmm. to uh, take over the, you know, kind of succeed my father in the family business, which I had been avoiding to kind of go my own way and, you know, have some accomplishments in other fields. I was actually in computer science for 13 years before going to law school, too. Got it. So let me ask you this. Would you say that – I I guess you're very familiar then with all the different wings and types of libertarians because I've always been a libertarian small l. I've only been a libertarian party member recently, of course aware of the LP for a long time, but – so I guess you're very aware of all the different factions and the different, you know, the, the minarchists versus the anarchists, the Austrians versus the others, the paleos versus the others, and I assume you're familiar with all that. I am. I am painfully familiar with pretty much every stripe and variety of libertarian you can have. Right. Um, and do do you have a self identification Are you what kind of libertarian would you say you are? Consequentialist, utilitarian, Randian, pragmatic, libertarian, uh, I mean, anarchist, minarchist, what? Uh, usually I go with just libertarian. Uh, my personal beliefs tend towards anarchy. Um, I, I like to think of it as kind of they, they go asymptotically towards anarchy but may never quite touch. Yeah. I and don't. I don't go objectivist. Um, no offense to the objectivists, although Rand did hate the Libertarian Party with a deep and abiding passion. Well, she hated libertarians. Uh, and that feeling she hated is, libertarians in general, actually, right? She hated a lot of people. Ayn Rand uh, had no no lack of hatred. Um, you know, one of the things that she hated the most was when people pointed out 
how much of her work was derivative uh, because she was very convinced that she had original thoughts about everything. And um, she's sort of like the opposite of Newton. You know how Newton used to say that he only got to where he was by standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, Rand would be the sort of person that would deny that giants existed. Yeah, except for Aristotle. She would say she stood on the shoulder of Aristotle, maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah like, pretty much the entire philosophical thing from Aristotle to Rand was an empty desert, according yeah. to her. Yeah, it's, sort of, uh, it's a little bit unre- – it just reminded me that I have this little joke with my son who's 15-year-old, and you know how Tr- uh, Trump with his wall, they've, uh, they've dropped the, the participle the – so it's, it's not like he's in favor of the wall. He's just in favor of walls. He'll say, we're building wall. So now my, my my joke with my son and I is like, hey, what do you want for dessert? He'll just say wall. <laughs> like, so, so I think for, for Ayn Rand, Aristotle is like wall. It's like who do you depend on, Aristotle? Just one thing, you know, but yep. um, anyway, a little tangent there. My, my mind's a little crazy. Uh, uh, and so why would you say you're not a Randian? Is it because you didn't come in that way? You haven't read her? You don't like her? Or you or Ron Paulian? Or uh, what, what? So I've read a lot of of Rand. I've actually read, I want to say, most everything. There's probably some esoterica that I haven't read, but I mean everything from Anthem through, uh, you know, the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. I actually did a philosophy paper on Atlas Shrugged. Um, back in undergrad. So it's, I try, when I decide that I'm not going to be something, I try to come by it honestly, you know, by doing a deep dive into it and realizing that that doesn't work for me. And really it's Rand's view of interpersonal human relationships. That's kind of the breaking point for me. You know, the, the, the elevation of her personal aesthetic preferences vis-a-vis human relationships and her conceptualization of altruism, um, which is a little bit uh, too sophistic for me anyway, it just, it doesn't work for me. Uh, My experience is different from that. And I don't try and hew to beliefs that don't work in the real world, um, which is not to say I'm entirely consequentialist, but, you know, I want to see how stuff works. It's kind of like, um, to just jump a different tangent, people ask all the time, why doesn't the party do more to support ranked choice voting? You know, why, why aren't you guys trumpeting this as the one thing that is going to be the silver bullet that's going to make the Libertarian Party more viable? And we do support it, and we have supported initiatives and, you know, given money for campaigns and things like that. But personally, I want to see a few elections held with ranked choice voting in places like Maine and see what uh, empirically bears out as far as who wins and who loses, because a lot of this stuff is still strictly theoretical. And, you know, maybe it's my time as a, you know, doing litigation and dealing with people's lives. I like to see how things work in the real world, you know, kind of outside of the ivory tower. Right. I, I was uh, I was just speaking at the New Hampshire Liberty Forum uh, a couple weeks ago, and there was a big booth by these guys promoting the ranked choice voting. Um, maybe maybe you can explain what that is. Uh, if, uh, from what I can tell, it's basically a political analog of um, when you have corporate voting for board of directors. You know the way you vote that you can stack your votes a certain way. Um, I mean, my cynical thought is that if if it would work to make more libertarians be elected, then that's one reason the the state political machine would not allow it to happen. So, if yeah, it's successful, so it, it wouldn't rank work. Choice, it, yeah, and that's probably a little more cynical than I would go. But rank choice voting, it's a voting system in which you get to send more of a signal than you send in our first past the post system. Because in the first past the post, you have to pick one of the candidates, and that's your vote, and that's it. In ranked choice voting, you get to say, you know, if there's four people running for mayor of Phoenix, for example, you can pick up to four in whatever order you like them. So you could put Sarwark first if you're, you know, a hardcore libertarian, but then you could decide that, you know, in absence of a libertarian – you would prefer a progressive Democrat 
And so then you would put Kate Gallego next. And then, you know, in absence of a progressive Democrat, you'd take kind of a middle of the road law enforcement backed, you know, kind of moderate Democrat. And then you put Valenzuela next and then you'd be like, well, if all else fails, I'll go with the Republican. And you put Sanchez last. And then what happens is because you provided that extra information on your ballot, if your first choice gets eliminated early, your vote then gets redistributed to your second choice. So it, what it allows you to do, the advantage of it as a, a voting method, is it allows you to vote for exactly what you want and specify what you want if you don't get your first choice. Um, it's very similar to, I used to work for the Association of American Medical Colleges, and they do uh, a national match between medical students and residencies. And it's, you know, the, the students rank the places they want to go in an ordered list, and then the schools rank the, the resident applicants in an ordered list, and then the computers do a lot of the matching to find an ideal um, equilibrium based on those data points that have been fed into it. So there's a lot of potential in ranked choice voting. The real question that, that isn't answered for me is what does that do to the kind of candidates that run and the kind of candidates that win in a system like that where second place means something more than it did before? Right. And, and to me, it's not obvious that this system has anything to do with liberty or libertarianism per se. Uh, it's just another voting mechanism, and the only reason we would care is if it tended to result in more liberty or more libertarians being elected. But if it did, that's one reason that the state wouldn't allow it to – like they're, they're happy to allow us to do things that don't cost them anything, like free speech. You know, uh, Protests don't cost them much, so they let us do it, and it makes us think that we have a say-so. Right. They let us vote, et cetera. So – um, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't, it doesn't sound like you have strong. You sound cynical. It. Well, it's, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm anti-state, and I just, I just, I don't see that. I mean, I'm, I'm skeptical of political methods to achieve liberty. But as I said, I just joined the LP last year. I, I think I'll be honest. You know, I've always been skeptical of politics as the means of changing uh, or achieving liberty, and I still am. But I decided to join because yeah. I figured, you know what? These are my people. These are also libertarians. They're trying their way, so why not join them? Right. Why not? Why not join the LP? But um, well, um, I mean, I'm, you 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 probably saved money in your life, right? I assume that you don't take your entire retirement portfolio and put it into one stock from one company. I that's an assumption. You could be, you know one of those people that does that, but most people believe in diversifying in order to avoid catastrophic risk. That's what, you know, when people say, well, I don't want to vote for, you know, less than a perfect person or somebody I don't agree with a hundred percent, or I don't think voting counts or it helps or whatever. The way I look at it is it's the same as having, you know, a small amount of real estate or precious metals in your portfolio. You don't sink everything into it. You don't think that it's going to be the thing that makes you filthy rich, but it's a nice hedge, and you know, oftentimes it's countercyclical. So I look right. at political participation as a thing that is worth doing and worth doing as best we can to try and get maximal votes and get as much as we can get through the political process, but it's not everything. You know, it's not the be all end all. And and I think that that's a healthy balance. You know, it's the same as uh, a lot of people are skeptical of the courts and whether or not the courts can be beneficial. But I think that the work that the Institute for Justice does is still good, even though they often get, um, you know, beaten pretty badly on rational basis review because it's a fundamentally rigged system. Even if you know the game is rigged, sometimes you play anyway just because you know, there's there's honor in the struggle. You see, you're pretty good at sounding reasonable without sounding like a fanatic, so that's impressive, a, a good balance <laughs> to, to achieve. Uh, and that, that leads to what uh, you and I were kind of uh, squabbling about on Facebook was this uh, this Supreme Court case that just was handed down a couple of days ago. The uh, Was it Temp or Temp or something like that? 
It's Indiana versus Tim's. T I M B S. Yeah. Tim's, Mr. Tim's right. was caught with some heroin, uh, which in Indiana and federally is not okay with our government, even though it's totally okay with me. Um, and as part of his plea deal, he pled guilty to something. I want to say he got a probation sentence, uh, as one often does with a first time drug offense, but they took his Land Rover to court under a civil asset forfeiture proceeding and proceeded to seize it. Now this is a $42,000 Land Rover that he had bought with a life insurance settlement from his, uh, I think his father passed away in an untimely manner. Um, the maximum fine for heroin distribution or whatever level of, of offense that he had in Indiana was $10,000. So his lawyer said, look, you know, you can't take a $42,000 car for something that has a maximum penalty of 10 grand that's excessively punitive and it violates the Eighth Amendment um, prohibition against excessive fines. And uh, one of the lower level courts agreed with that. And then the Indiana Supreme Court said, no, because the Eighth Amendment's never been incorporated against the state. So we can totally take a, a Land Rover for this or anything else. And I believe the Solicitor General for Indiana during oral argument was asked by one of the justices, you know, if there's a law against speeding and somebody goes five miles an hour over and you arrest them for it, can you seize the vehicle? And he's like, yes, but right. we wouldn't. Which right. is not that's a good that's answer that's at that's oral that's argument. That's right. That's right. not that's how you get a nine to nothing unanimous decision written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg establishing that there's a fundamental um right incorporated through the fourteenth amendment, uh due process clause was her preferred method that even a state government can't violate. Um and I think, you know, it's I don't want to say it's that big of a case because it just prevents excessive forfeiture, but it doesn't really upend the, the structure of legalized highway robbery that is the civil asset forfeiture system. But it's like, how do you eat an elephant, right? You, one bite at a time. Right. So, and I, it's a and good I bite. Would, and I would agree that, look, uh, take income tax. So we, I, I, I don't know about you, but I want zero income tax. But if, if I can reduce it by 3%, that's a win. It's not a perfect win, but right. it's, it's a movement in the right direction. Um, and I would agree that this, in slightly limiting the, the power of state governments, maybe not the federal government, but the state governments, slightly limiting their power to impose outrageous uh, fines of, of the civil asset forfeiture type for statutory uh, crimes is probably a slight win. It's not a big win. It's sort of like the, fir the first step back. And and as a libertarian, I'm all in favor of taking first a step slight. Back's a good act. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm all in favor of a slight win. It's just that uh, number one, as a libertarian and as an anarchist, well, first of all, even as a regular libertarian, we're against drug laws in the first place. So <clears throat> possession Correct. of heroin shouldn't be a crime in the first place. And so there's no victim. There's no actual damages. So the, action, the question of an excessive fine is – to us, it's irrelevant. There should be no Any fine, fine in the first place. Right, and so um, – but fine, so that they limited it a little bit. But my big issue, and the one I think we disagreed on, is this issue of libertarian centralism or this idea that you mentioned earlier, uh, incor selective incorporation. Uh, and just for people who are not familiar with this, let me just lay it out, and if you disagree, you can tell me. But basically the, the, the 13 states formed the federal government. I assume you agree with that, although some of the Jaffa types and some of the Timothy Sandifer and Cato types don't agree with that. They think that the federal government was like the original American government formed by the will of the people, even though it was ratified with only 11 states out of 13, and the, the final two – didn't need to have amended uh, ratified it, but you know the, the the whole concept of a national government is 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 irrational. I believe in the U.S. It's, we have a, a we have a enumerated powers government, which is unique in the right. world. It doesn't have general legislative power, 
it doesn't have the power to violate free speech rights or even to legislate on the issue of drugs. Um, and right. So, there's no there's no federal police power. At least there's no federal a, po- police power. By the letter or, of the Constitution, there's no federal police power. But the founders were afraid that they would get out of hand, so they put these Bill of Rights in as an extra limit on what they could do. So they said, just to be clear, Congress cannot pass a law limiting freedom of speech. Congress cannot regulate uh, uh, the rights of our arms. So these were like right. extra limitations on what the federal government could do because the federal government had limited powers. And But then after slavery, and- after the 14th Amendment uh, – it, that was enacted to basically try to get the southern states in line and to try to remedy the aftermath of slavery and to abolish slavery. 13th Amendment ended slavery. 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote. Right. 14th Amendment had these three clauses in it, and one of which is the due process clause. Another is the privileges and immunities clause, and the other is the equal protection clause, which basically said you can't right. treat people differently based upon their race. Right. Which right, we we all agree with. Similarly that situated right? people have to be treated the same. Uh, race, sex, uh, you know, there's applications. You know, I love the Fourteenth Amendment. I just, you know, to to kind of put my cards on the table, I think there's an incredible power in the principles of equal protection um, that were not fleshed out enough in the the original draft of the constitution if you will and and it it settles some debates well settles their debates um for example marriage equality you know there are libertarians who would posit that the government shouldn't be involved in people's interpersonal relationships period there shouldn't be any government marriage and so the real quote real libertarian position is get government out of marriage which is technically correct, uh, which if you're a Futurama fan is the best kind of correct, but what it, what it fails to deal with is the reality of the world in which we live, which is as long as government's giving out licenses for people to marry, it should treat people equally before the law. This idea of, of equal protection is that everybody is treated equally before the law. That's, that's what the rule of law means. And so if you're going to be handing out marriage licenses or you're, you know, take the transgender ban on people serving in the military, if you're going to let people sign up to go shoot people overseas for our government, you shouldn't restrict that to certain classes of people. Whether or not it's a good idea to go sign up to do that, that's a personal judgment question, but you shouldn't block that way in a discriminatory fashion. So right. anyway, sorry, got on my well, 14th Amendment soapbox. Well, no, and that's what we're going to talk about, and I, I appreciate your your motivations, and I actually agree with a lot of what you said. I totally disagree with you on the military issue. Uh, on the marriage okay. issue, we, 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 I actually agree with you, but for maybe a slightly different set of reasons. On the military issue, that's not a civil right. Uh, military people are not doing good by and large. You don't have a right to a job in the military. And the military is especially is a, 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 has special functions and requirements, and I just the whole thing seems like a mess to import uh, transgender and, and 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 marriage equality and gay issues into that. I just I don't see how that has anything to do with liberty. Um, as for the marriage issue, though, um, I mean in a way this is like the. Immigration issue. You could say that in a free, in a perfect world, we could have free immigration. But given that we have welfare and public property and anti-discrimination laws, you you just can't have both both. You can't have open open borders and and welfare. You got to choose one or the other. Oh, so so, so, so some libertarians argue too. that way. I'm not saying I agree <laughs> one way or the other. I'm just saying, but but for for marriage equality, what you're saying is when the well, the way I would look at it is if the government is going to monopolize the field of contract enforcement, then they have to enforce contracts that people settle on. And I would just look at the mar- the matrimonial regime as we call it in, 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 in civil law property in the continental law. 
the matrimonial regime is a is a, is a contractual incident of a, a personal relationship, and the, it's really none of the government's business what people call their relationship. If you call it marriage, a partnership, it's really not up to the government. Right. But they need to recognize the contractual aspects of it. And if the government itself says that we will only recognize these legal aspects if we call it a marriage, well, then they have to call it a marriage because they're the ones that are that right. insisted on this. If the, if, if the government had early on said, you can call it a marriage or a domestic partnership, and we'll recognize it. We don't care what you do privately. Then there would have been no. It would have deflated the balloon of the of the of the of the, of the of, you know the, the gay rights movement because they would have had nothing to complain right. about as long as their domestic partnerships were being recognized on the same level legally. So, but, I I was in favor is, of the Lawrence into, result, by the way. Right. Well, this is where it gets to you know, and this is. This is kind of the difference between the theoretical and and the real politic, or, or you know, the the man in the arena kind of stuff. Because what you're getting into is kind of game theory and negotiation, where you had in this country prior to uh, Obergefell, you had different levels of privileges available to people who were in certain kinds of relationships that were privileged by the state. So if you were in a relationship that is called a marriage between a man and a woman, you get favorable tax treatment, you got to um, visit your loved one in the hospital without having to go through a bunch of forms, you didn't have to develop other contracts, you were in a legally uh, predictable situation because you had a large body of case yes. law about yes. what was and wasn't allowed in marriage. Yes. And what happened was the people who were privileged under that system didn't want to extend those privileges to people of, of the same sex. Right. And so they, they started their negotiating position with, you can't have this period. Then they sort of, some of them backed off and went to the whole, like, you know, you can have a civil union, but you can't call it marriage. Very similar to race relations and the whole, let's do separate but equal for a while. Right. And it wasn't good enough. And then they lost in court. And when they had sort of gone too far and lost, that's when you got a lot of people kind of sour grapes. Uh, you know, the government shouldn't be involved in marriage at all, and we should right. just get government out of all marriage relationships. In the same way that post Brown v. Board, you had southern states that were trying to dismantle their entire public education systems rather than integrate. You know, it's like we've lost. So now we're going to take our ball and go home. Correct. And I think that's right. And yeah. these are good lessons for us to learn from in how we deal with each other, how we negotiate these issues, how we do political compromise. That if you try, you know, it's, it's like the whole thing that they say about Wall Street. Bears get fat and bulls get fat, but hogs get slaughtered. Yeah. If you try and, and, and take too much you will lose. Right, and I think I agree with you on everything you said uh, here. Um, uh, and, and, and you could argue that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment does – I actually have arguments that it doesn't apply to the states for two reasons. Number one, the mm -hmm. 14th Amendment was – well, it's unlibertarian, and it's unjustified, and it <laughs> – and it was it was never ratified properly because uh, because the final state that ratified it was coerced and they they withdrew their ratification consent and the Congress ignored it. So you could argue technically legally the Fourteenth Amendment was never ratified, but you could argue that about a couple of other amendments too. And at a certain point, laws become de facto yeah. the law. So uh, I actually think the Fourteenth Amendment was not constitutionally ratified, so it's actually not the law of the right. land. And even even then, I think it doesn't outlaw secession, which is the ultimate out. So a state that doesn't agree with the decision of the Supreme Court saying they have to do X, Y, and Z, they can just leave. Uh, but the, everyone says the Supreme Court settled that. But but um, well, but and no, that's so, where that's where I like to draw these distinctions because I've had these arguments. If you spend enough time in libertarian circles, you end up talking to sovereign citizen people and tax right, protesters right, right, right. about how the Sixteenth Amendment doesn't doesn't uh, apply, and I try and stay out of those debates right. by 
accepting that, hey, maybe you're right on some sort of hyper-technical or historical accuracy right. uh, point that there's some flaw in the drafting or there's a flaw in the ratification right. or Texas really never came back into the union or whatever, but I'm going to live my life based on what does this mean to me? And if I don't pay my federal income tax, they're going right. to put a lien on my property and they're going to take it. Right. So the philosophical arguments are, are interesting, but only to a point. And that's kind of, you know, philosophically, I do believe in the right of secession as, you know, the very same kind of self-determination that led to the founding of the country in the first place in the declaration. Right. However, comma, practically speaking, that is settled. Uh, we had a war, a lot of people died, and, uh, you know, I think the right side won. Other people disagree with me on that, but it is what it is, and we are where we're at. Well, I so I, I would – in a lot of ways, I would agree with that. Like, I think we should have a pragmatic view. We should recognize the law for what it is, not for what we want it to be, and distinguish between them. I wouldn't equate the arguments of the of the sovereign nut – the sovereign – Citizen people and the common law court nut types. I wouldn't equate that, and 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 the income tax processors, by the way, I w they're they're all right. basically crazy. I wouldn't equate right. them to the people that um, have a sound legal argument um, for the way the Fourteenth Amendment ought to be interpreted. And I'll I'll tell you why, because as I said, I would agree that the Equal Protection Clause seems to be a pretty broad application to the states, and you could use that mm -hmm. to argue. For the marriage, uh, for the gay marriage uh, 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 right, case. Right. Uh, although, honestly, if you if you just think back and you say, do you think that the framers and the and the public at the time of the Fourteenth Amendment, eighteen sixty seven or whenever it was ratified, would they have agreed that this equal protection language meant that homosexuals could be married in states? I, I think that that's absolutely they wouldn't. It's like ludicrous. it doesn't, it doesn't fall under original public meaning. No, so it doesn't um, fall there. But again, you can, yeah, yeah. That ahead. that argument, as I as I say, it's about three fifths correct. Uh, and, yeah, you know, our little constitutional scholars will get <laughs> catch that reference. Um, but, so, but you know, but, I, I but, think. Yeah. So 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 you could argue the equal protection clause did justify the the gay marriage case, but but the other. The substantive rights, like in the recent uh, civil asset forfeiture, for, when you say that the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Third Amendment, the Eighth Amendment apply to the states, what you're saying is that mm -hmm. there are substantive rights that are incorporated by the Fourteenth Amendment and applied to the states. And the, of course, right. the traditional interpretation, what happened was in, in the late 1800s, the slaughterhouse cases challenged this New Orleans slaughterhouse monopoly thing. And the Supreme Court said uh, that's not part of privileges and immunities, and so they struck it down. Uh, the, yeah. they, they refused to strike it down. And later on, of course, the government got more power. The central government got more powerful, and they started using the due process clause of the Fifth Fourteenth Amendment instead. Right. So what they said was the due process right. clause, which is presumptively procedural, has substantive rights as well. And they incorporate the fundamental rights in the Bill of Rights, something like that, right? And over time, they've selectively yeah, that, incorporated some of them. And today or this week, they incorporated yet another one. They've done like 90 percent of, right. of the Bill of Rights, but th there's a couple little things left like uh, trial by jury for civil cases and things like that, which has not yet yep. been incorporated against the states. Uh, and finally, Third Amendment. Yeah, so finally they've done the eighth – the the excessive fines part that's what that's what this recent case was right right and and the thing is again this comes back to the the kind of real politics of going too far oh wait sorry my poodle's going right. crazy all right they're so, done now no problem so it's the whole it's the whole real politic of going too far so you had a post reconstruction supreme court in, in the slaughterhouse cases that said, yeah, you know, when we passed this 14th Amendment, it was supposed to make it so that the, the southern states could not continue to oppress African-Americans in the way that they did prior to losing the Civil War. 
but it doesn't really mean what it says, and the privileges and immunities don't really mean anything. I mean, if you read Slaughterhouse, they, they, they're basically yeah. eviscerated that I, 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 I agree with you. That's, that's what they did. I agree and, with you. And what happens when you do that is that's how you end up with, with the due process clause getting elevated because you're going to pick yeah. up another piece of the amendment that wasn't vitiated I and agree. use it. And it's funny because there are, there are things that are different about the clauses. You know, one of the things that, that struck me about the Tim's case is you have Gorsuch and I cannot remember the other one. Oh, it was Thomas. Thomas uh, and which Gorsuch. Other justice. Thomas and Gorsuch. Gorsuch and Thomas wanted to use privileges and immunities. Yes. They've been I by the don't like reasoning. Right. privileges and immunities. Because privileges and immunities references citizens, yes. whereas due process references persons. And much like the whole immigration debate, uh, you know, I, I come to my libertarianism from a, a basic individualist belief in the goodness or the, the, the dignity of all human beings, regardless of where they are from, where they live, what yes. side of the border they were born on. Like, I believe in individual rights full stop. Yes. And so when we use constitutional provisions that elevate citizens of the country over persons who are here in the country. Yeah, so, so you're saying I you're not an American. You're, you're a libertarian first. You're, you're basically a libertarian first, not yes. an American. Correct. I, I believe that fundamentally libertarianism is – if not anti-nationalist, yeah, it's, 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 it's at least humanist. orthogonal to nation Yes, yeah, it's humanist. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pro-human. I agree. I totally agree. And that's why I like due process better than, than privileges and immunities. Um, I, I, you know, I do too, but the problem I, is due process is a process. I mean the word process means it's a procedure. And what they right. try to do is they try to incorporate substance into process. And – like Thomas right. McCarthy, who's one of the greatest constitutional scholars that I admire, he argues that actually makes sense. But honestly, in the end, I think it doesn't. Um, process means giving someone a process, a fair trial, a public hearing, make sure there's no retroactive laws, make sure the laws are publicized that they know they're violating. But basically right. it just means as long as the government does it by the right procedure, they can still kill you and, and, and conscript you and take your property and put you in jail. Right. Well, it's like the argument over the death penalty versus life without parole. You know, I'm a death penalty abolitionist. However, I understand that if somebody gets thrown, if somebody gets condemned to execution, there are going to be lots of people who are going to look for potential ways to exonerate and places where the evidence might not have been right because, you know, death, quote, death is different, I believe, uh, uh, comes from the Supreme Court. But life without parole ain't that great. And what you do when you get an LWOP sentence, very few people look into to those kind of exonerations because they figure, you know, at least we're not killing this guy. Well, okay. And so you and, get and, to and, these, uh, these yeah. places where, you know, when you eviscerate privileges and immunities, you kind of, if, if our goal is to protect individual liberty, and you've taken away a tool that you think legally makes more more sense, you know, privileges and immunities makes more sense as a tool. If you take that tool away, it's like you you take my screwdriver and I have to unscrew something, I'll use a butter knife. It's probably not good for the butter well, knife. Yeah. I'll probably yeah, slip a couple times. But it, it's got to get unscrewed. It's the same thing. When the southern states – decided that they wanted to, even though they lost, they still wanted to take those rights away. That's where you get the 14th Amendment. That's where you get all those clauses, because the state governments had sub plenary police power, uh, you know, subject to the restrictions of the 10th, which is not that strong, or the 9th, which, again, has not been used I, I actually to the, the, the fullest the nine, potential. The tenth, the, well, the 10th of the 9th don't restrict the states. They restrict the federal government, but that's a different issue. Mm, yeah. yeah. But when you when the states go too far afield in their violations of individual liberties, that's where you get the 14th Amendment from. That's where you get incorporation. It's you had a tool, you abused it, you don't get to use the tool anymore. Well, um, but, but and you, I'm okay you, with that. Yeah, I'm I'm okay with it as a libertarian because in the end I'm results oriented too. I'm consequentialist in a sense. 
But you could say this. I mean, if the United States invades uh, invades Iraq to change, or even Iran right now to get rid of their laws against uh, homosexuality, you could say that that's a good thing libertarianly. But the means used to do it are completely dangerous to liberty too, right? And but there's I, a I, big I, difference between an armed invasion and a constitutional amendment that was passed under the, the rubric well, that we it, have, well, regardless of the ratification question. Well, hold on a second, but the 14th Amendment was passed after an armed invasion, so that was a result of an armed invasion, the Civil War. So you can't just say it's like the, I agree there's a there's some difference. <laughs> But uh, armed invasion, look, you know, illegal secession, uh, tomato, tomato, right? Well, I'm I don't sure think the secession was illegal. All the I, lost I, cause stuff. Well, I don't think the southern states were any more libertarian or better than the north. In fact, they were worse in probably most ways. <laughs> uh, but they right. did they did have a right to secede under the Constitution, just like they would have under the Articles of Confederation. In other words, there was just simply no. There was no power granted to this federal government to stop it, which is why it's Co- implicitly Co- illegal. Is legal. Well, yeah, and, and and you know that's probably going to be way more than we're going to be able to resolve today. But the oh, the question oh, of whether or now, not an now institution or a government has the right to maintain its existence. Look, you know, I'm just saying, this I'm just gets into who, like basic Marbury government? stuff. Wait, right? are you saying that if, the federal if, government if has silence? A, I'm sorry. I think we got. Uh, are you saying the federal government has a right to maintain its existence, or you think that's part of their uh, the argument you could use? I, there's a there's a solid indication. You've developed a constitution. You you've created a government from whole cloth, right? Yes. With the yes. consent of the governor, such as it was, that there is an implication that maintain that institution is implied as a power. Yes, and I think that was a – I would call that a danger, right? And that's one reason I am opposed to the Constitution but personally it, as a libertarian in the first place because they, sh- they should have known that was going to happen, right? Well, yeah. I mean that that's a basic – that's basic human institutions. I mean that's the reason that we still have NATO even though we don't have a Soviet bloc. Well, we have institutions we have, we have the, we probably maintain have the themselves. Authority. I mean we probably still have the Rural Electrification Administration or uh, – well, we but I, we I mean, just got rid of the Spanish American War telephone tax. What, like three years ago? Well, and Ger- Germany just paid off their World War One debts in 2010. I mean, these. Uh, right. Let me, let me, but I mean, there, treat, inertia is a big thing in government. Which is one reason we should be loath to create a new government like the federal government, which the Constitution did. So I think the Constitution is completely unlibertarian, and when libertarians pass out the pocket Constitution. As if it's a libertarian pamphlet, I want to cringe. I want to like, I want to bite my ankle well, off. But... And that is, I mean, that's a place where I've gotten into arguments with uh, um, more of your either constitutional conservatives or some of the the paleos, uh, you know, that have real good feelings for this idea of states' rights and. They're like, well, don't you support the Constitution? Don't you support the Tenth Amendment? And my answer is yes, when it's beneficial to individual liberty. Yes. And yes, no, yes, 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 when yes. it's not beneficial to individual yes. liberty. Like, yes. And it's, as a, as a libertarian, the tool that you use is orthogonal to the goal that you have. I, and, and as a libertarian, I agree. And in fact, I wrote something 20 years ago, and I, I basically view the, the Constitution – as instrumental, like we have to look at it like if it's favorable towards liberty, okay. If not, not. Right. But I do think there's a role for honesty and sound legal reasoning. So I think that we yeah. should not pretend like the due process clause or the privileges and immunities clause was supposed to implement some libertarian revolution. Look, if you as an advocate in court can push this argument for your client, go for it. But yeah. let's not let's no. not pretend among ourselves that it really was meant to be libertarian. So I'm actually kind of intrigued that you. I thought you would be arguing that, like the Cato, Ro, uh, Roger, uh, Roger Pallon, Randy Barnett, these guys. I thought you'd be arguing that we should do what Thomas and Gorsuch argued and 
abandon the due process clause in favor of the P&I clause. Uh, no, I'm, I'm more persuaded by Sandifer, uh, if you if you come down to it, and, and his arguments that the due process clause really is supposed to do stuff like that. But you, you do have a point. These constitutional provisions, at the time that they're drafted, at the time that they're ratified, the intent of the provision was to do the thing that they were trying to do. So you're immediately post-Civil War. The intent of the provision is to not let the southern states continue to treat African Americans like slaves in all but name. That's the goal. The goal is, like, don't get them lynched. Let them testify. Well, actually, if you read some of those debates, they were like, well, it doesn't even say that you let them vote necessarily. Like, well, that's why there was a very limited amount. Right. There is a limited amount of what they were intending to do. But the beauty of language is that you can then use that tool to do other things to a point. Right. There, there, you stretch it as much as you can in the same way that, you know, yes. free speech doesn't just cover a Gutenberg press. It covers the Internet now. You know, the, yes. the freedom of the press covers bloggers, even though they don't work for an official news organization. I think that we should stretch the Constitution to the maximum liberty maximizing point that it will bear. Um, but yes. recognize that, you know, the best thing you can say about the Constitution Churchill said about democracy is it's a terrible system except for all the other ones. You know, well, our constitutional republic is has some very there are some flaws in the constitution, there are some flaws in the application and checks and balances don't work as well as we would like them to work, but I would constitution um, you know our limitations on governance governance are much stronger than, say, the Magna Carta limits the the government of the United Kingdom. Hmm. We have teeth in ours. Hmm. We do, they're, but they're, but they're duller but they're than sharp, we want. They're small. They're sharp and small teeth, and they let a lot of things slip through because. They yeah, I, I know what you mean, but but well, let me let me ask you this though. Um, Sandifer's view is the Jaffa view. That's why I mentioned Jaffa earlier. That's the view that the uh, the American nation is basically a sovereign. So they they view the U the U S government as a government of plenary powers. However, they have to manipulate it or, or manage this like through the mm. police clause or whatever, and that it was voted right. for by the, the the mass of people in the U S, not the states. Um, I th- I mean I think that's totally uh, uh, ahistorical. I agree with Kirkpatrick uh, and with Berger on this. I think that we had 13 states. In fact, we only had 11 states that ratified the well, original constitution, right? So there was only 11 states when the constitution became into force. There weren't 13. Well, the, the nature right? the nature of representation in the colonial era was I mean the the franchise was far less spread. Um, yes, you still had a lot of good old boy stuff. So the idea that that was a popular consent of the governed, uh, it's a bit of a stretch. I mean, they didn't yell about it. You know, I mean, social contract theory of any stripe, whether it's this or, you know, the broader social contract theory, it's always a stretch, right? It's never really a contract. It's a shorthand for us to talk about things. It's the same way, you know, one of my frustrations in libertarian land is you talk to anarcho-capitalists and they're convinced that private property is some sort of first principles thing, and you know, which is, is also ahistorical. It does not um, recognize that, that this arbitrary bundle of rights that we call property, whether it's real or chattel, developed over a long history of time and it is arbitrary you know if you look just look at european inheritance law and its evolution over time what what you can and can't do with your property alienability things like that these are legal structures that are created to privilege certain kinds of ownership over other kinds of ownership and there are choices that are made in the system and all systems are going to benefit some people more than others and i think acknowledging that 
makes us better able to deal with suggestions that we move into different property regimes. For example, you know, the, the current uh, fad is towards moving uh, towards socialism. It's easier to advocate against socialism if you acknowledge that our current system of private property um, disintermediated and, and liability controlled corporate structures and things like that, the system picks winners and losers. And if you don't acknowledge that the system picks winners and losers, then you aren't able to make a good defense for why this system is better than the other system. If you're trying to start from, you know, this system is just what, what springs ab initio from the state of man, like, Making arguments like that makes you look dumb, in my opinion. Well, you're very eloquent. I think we agree on far more than some people would think. Uh, let me give you a quick – I kept you longer than we talked about. Let me give you a quick lightning round of three three final questions, okay? Sure. Okay, number one, should should the Supreme Court overturn Roe versus Wade, yes or no, in your opinion? Probably not. Okay. Give me more. Do you want, do you want <laughs> yeah, exposition? Give me more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Why? It was it's a poorly written opinion as as a lawyer, but there is a significant amount of uh, what would now be detrimental reliance on that structure. Yeah, yeah. It's too ingrained. And, Another and too the, ingrained. Yeah. And the other thing is the right of privacy is kind of like the the equal protection clause like you can do a lot of good libertarian stuff with that so it's not a tool i would like to give up but but would you kind of agree as a common sense decent normal person that aborting a eight month old fetus is a little bit morally disturbing yes oh so uh you we're gonna have to do this another time if you want to talk about abortion because it gets deep. Um, yeah, it's not something I would do. Uh, you know, some of these things are, are kind of like it's kind of like the war on drugs is no, you no, can agree different. that it's drug different. abuse is a problem. But the regime that would be necessary to prohibit it is worse than the problem. No, And that's basically and that's my, kind that's, of where yeah. I come down on abortion. Yeah, that's my view, too. But don't you agree that late term abortion is akin to murder in some cases? can be. It can yeah. be. And, okay. you know, the question is how much surveillance and how much law enforcement yeah, yeah, do you yeah, want yeah. involved between a, a person and their doctor in order to catch those rare outlier cases that might cross that line? Well, I'm an anarchist, so my solution is to put the jurisdiction on the family. So it's just the jurisdiction is in the family. Um, I view it as an That has its own and, problems. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a way of punting, but it's my it's my elegant yeah. solution. So right, number, question number two. You're punting two. down to a small group. Okay, so uh, would you what would you think about the Supreme Court uh, striking down drug laws with some cobbled together argument based upon the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, privacy rights, privileges, immunities, due process? I don't know. What would you think about uh, just saying that all drug laws are unconstitutional? And by the way, I think the the best argument would be the Tenth Amendment, but that's just my crazy view. But what do you think? Well, I, the best argument is is the historical precedent of prohibition, Article um, Article Two, Section Eight, is that it's just outside of the police power that you know yeah. was granted under our limited power. That's the best argument. Like you want to talk about clean. Yep, legal that, hit. That's my Tenth Amendment. The problem is, yep, right. you have you have case law that upheld um, the original. Uh, I can't remember the act, but basically they upheld the drug laws, and so we don't get to go back there. Um, right. But I'd be happy with striking it down. On I think privacy is actually one of your better avenues um, under sort of a Lawrence Griswold theory. That what you put into your body in your home is really not the state's business, period, and that that the state should not be able to to get to the point where they can figure out that you're shooting up heroin. Right. Or you could argue Eighth Amendment too, like it's excessive punishment. It's like what damage have they done? Uh, yeah. Eighth 
eighth is tough. Eighth, eighth is tough because because once you once you allow them to criminalize something, uh, you know, again, it comes back to like the weakness of due process. I know, my, but my but my Nick, we, professor we, we, used to say, due process just means that you get whatever process is due, which if you've ever practiced in admin law, is often very 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 little. I agree, but we did win on the Eighth Amendment this week, so let's not let's yeah. much. Uh, and actually, I, th- I think that the Eighth Amendment could be used as an argument against uh, copyright law because uh, it, uh, copyright ter- uh, fines are excessive given the quote-unquote damage is done. They're arbitrary. They're mm. crazy. $25,000 per incident. It could be literally $3 billion. No, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's very high. Um, there's just there's a there's a strong presumption towards the legal fiction that Congress thought long and hard about this stuff and creating those penalties, which no, is, I'm just you know, saying that they not true. The <laughs> no, it's not true. So my final question was going to be, uh, how do we get intellectual property abolition on the Libertarian Party uh, platform? And I already have Karen Ann Harlow's working on putting a version of that in the. LP Colorado uh, uh, platform. We're talking today actually about that. So uh, that's a good start if you can get it accepted in state party. For example, the the Libertarian Party of Texas had a death penalty abolition plank for I think nearly a decade prior to the National Party adopting one. So getting it adopted at state party level is a good way to get people familiar with it. It's also you get to hash out the arguments in lower stakes. To get in a national platform, you need two-thirds of the delegates at convention from the entire country to agree that it is both important enough to put into the platform and you need agreement on the language that that it's going to get broad uh, acceptance. And I think we've talked about this kind of offline. I don't know is a hard abolition of intellectual property is going to get two-thirds. I think curtailing some of the excesses, you know, extensive copyright terms 76 years after the the death of the author, I think that's the kind of stuff you can get broad support for. Undermining the entire edifice, I think, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's like the civil asset forfeiture thing in Tim's to bring it full circle. You eat the elephant one bite at a, at a time. The, the problem I have is that uh, patent and copyright are federal laws, and so I don't really know if states I don't even know what a state platform would be because state platforms are about what the state law should be, and they don't have IP law. That's a federal because it's been preempted right. by federal law. So, but I guess it would be a. But they start, have federal representatives. They or, have or, congressmen and, and senators. Like, yeah, we're going to nullify copyright law in our state, or I don't know. But well, it'd be, that's it'd be how smarter. that's how we built this country was nullifying everyone else's copyright and patent. True. That's true. We didn't we didn't adopt the Berlin Convention until the 1980s, actually. Um, no, I mean basically stealing IP from other countries was like how the these are the sort of historical things I wish more p- people knew that that our our country was built on piracy, you know. But again, these are shifting power dynamics, right? Like this is this is stuff like privilege theory and. When we're making money off of intellectual property, then all of a sudden we've got Mickey Mouse's lobbyists having, you know, excessive copyright penalties and excessive copyright terms. When we're the young scrappy upstart, it's like, patent? What patent? Not from the United States. Sorry. <laughs> and, you know, right now China is is where we were, right? And India is where we were vis-a-vis drugs and, and pharmaceutical patents. And so recognizing the dynamism of the intellectual property system, I think, is the first step to having good conversations. It's one of the things that I've always appreciated about Larry Lessig is he looks at kind of the overall system. He's wrong a lot, but he, but he looks at the dynamism of how the system works, and you get better solutions when you actually understand the overall system not just the piece you're tinkering with. I hear you. 
Well, I've kept you way longer than I said I would, so I appreciate your time, and I enjoyed it. And uh, I did, did I sandbag you? I, if so, I'll, I'll delete anything you want. No, not at all. <laughs> okay. Not at all, not at all. Um, I, this was a really good conversation. It was a lot of fun. Um, hopefully it will <coughs> go a long way to repairing relationships between the factions such as they are reparable. I think some of them aren't because they're fundamental, but some of them are probably are. You know, he- I'm not a monster. He- time heals all <laughs> wounds. Yeah, yeah, and dialogue helps. You know, it, if you can sit down and talk to somebody, it definitely changes your ability to caricature them because you know that they're real people. I agree. I agree. All right, thanks for your time, Nick. Well, this and, was great. Uh, good luck with the LP, and uh, I'm glad to be a member, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. Talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.